G'day folks, welcome to my channel. In this video, I want to talk about the top verses that churches twist to make millions of dollars. With every verse that I'm going to look at, I'm going to play you a clip from a, a pastor or a teacher of some kind in a church using that passage of scripture to try to con people into giving money to their ministry so that you can see how they're using the text. And then I'm going to respond to what they say with the correct interpretation from the word of God. And you're going to see very quickly that these people are twisting the word of God and people just don't see it because they don't read their Bibles. Now, if you want a copy of my notes, I've got a new method of distributing my notes. I'll put a link in the description of this video. You can click on that link. It'll take you to a Google form and you put your name and your email. And then on the confirmation screen, it'll have a link to a, a folder where you can access all of my uh, notes. Of course, I'm updating what's going to be in the folder. There's also some eBooks. There's a whole heap of Leonard Ravenhill eBooks up there as well. So there's some interesting stuff in there check it out. But let's get right into the video and let's look at the first passage of scripture. Actually, the first two, we're going to have two in one video. Uh, there are two passages that are frequently twisted uh, by preachers and teachers to try to make millions of dollars. Here's a clip from Joyce Meyer. In Luke, it says, Give and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. Well, men, give into your bosom. Listen to that. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. You know, maybe you're not used to giving much. Maybe you think you can't afford to do that. But you know what? You can't afford not to. God even says in Malachi, try me and see if you bring all the tithes and offerings into the storehouse if I won't open the windows of heaven. Try me. Wow. God saying, come on, put it to the test. Just do it and see what I do in your life. So Joyce Meyer has raised two verses. The first one is Luke chapter 6, verse 38. And the other one is Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. We want to look at both of these passages. The first passage, <clears throat> I think you really just need to read the context and it becomes very clear what the passage is about. It's really got nothing to do with giving money to your local church or giving money to a ministry. And I really want to stress that there is no verse that actually says you have to give money to your local church. And it's really because the, the day and age in which we live uh, does church completely wrong. Everybody does church completely wrong. In the New Testament, you didn't have like these church buildings that everybody met in and uh, and these the need to pay for the building costs, the electricity, uh, the cooling, the heating, the electric guitar, the drum kit, the um, the uh, keyboard and, and, and all this stuff. None of that stuff existed in the early church. None of it. People simply met in their homes. That's where they met. That's that's where the Christians met. They met in their homes and they helped people out who were in need. And when you had people that were ministering full time, elders that were working in the church, people shared with them so that they could support them. That's how it really worked in the New Testament. So, so really, when you, you think about the New Testament times, that they, if that's true, if what I'm saying to you is true, then you'll never find ever any single verse that talks about giving to the to the running costs of a local church so to speak but let's look at this passage here in Luke chapter 6 and to look at the context let's just begin at verse 32 to get the context it says and if you love those who love you what credit is that to you for even sinners love those who love them if you do good to those who do good to you what credit is that to you for even sinners do the same and if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you'll be the sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to the ungrateful and evil. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. And do not judge and you will not be judged. And do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon and you will be pardoned. Give and it will be given to you. They will pour out into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. For by the, your standard of measure, it will be measured 
to you in return. So you can see here the context of this passage is doing good to other people, you know, helping people out when they're in need. Uh, not only those who are good to you, but also your enemies. And in return, men will do good to you. And this is just true. If you're gracious and forgiving to people, if you help people out when they're in need, if you don't condemn people, um, then you'll receive the same treatment in return. Now, that's a general truth that is that Jesus is, is pointing out here. So this is not a passage of scripture that is talking about uh, uh, or, or giving, uh, laying down a requirement that you have to give money to the church. This is talking about giving to people around you when they are in need, even your enemies. That's, that's the context of the passage. Not just giving financial aid and material support, but also forgiveness, grace and mercy uh, when it's needed. But what about this passage in Malachi? Malachi 3.10 is, is a, a heavily misunderstood passage of Scripture. The prophet Malachi was prophesying during the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. Of course, Ezra and Nehemiah were sent to, Ezra was sent to rebuild the temple, and Nehemiah was sent to rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And what happened is that when you read the historical context, and I go into this in more detail in my tithing video, and you'll see more detail in the notes. If you click on the, the link in the description that I mentioned, you'll see my notes there. But what was happening in the historical context is that Nehemiah had gone back to Persia to speak with the king of Persia and to give an account of everything that was happening. And the high priest and the priests basically took all of the tithes and instead of placing them in the storehouse where they belonged so that the, the people would have food, remember, it's always food, it's never money, even though the word money is used 32 times in the book of Genesis alone, and the word shekel is used 32 times in the Pentateuch, and they, they had many other trades, nobody was ever required to tithe money. But what was happening was that when Nehemiah went away, the high priest and the priests with him basically took the tithes and offerings and put them in a great hall for Tobiah the Ammonite. Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was Nehemiah's arch enemy. And this is what Malachi was prophesying against. Nehemiah was prophesying against what the priests and Levites were doing. Instead of uh, putting the tithes in the storehouse for the people so that there would be food in God's uh, storehouse, instead they put it in a great hall for Tobiah the Ammonite. And that's why when you read Malachi, Malachi chapter 2, let's say you began at chapter 2, you'll see that the prophet Malachi from chapter 2 onwards is addressing the priests and the sons of Levi. And in chapter 2, he gets very strong and he says that he's going to cover them with dung, he says. He's going to cover them with dung. And really what that's saying when the prophet Malachi said that was um, very symbolic because when the priests offered sacrifices, they would take the dung and the carcass, they would take it outside of the city and they would burn it there. And what Malachi was saying in chapter 2 when he's addressing the priests is that God was going to smear dung on their face. They were going to be taken outside of Jerusalem and burnt. In other words, this is really a picture of taking these wicked priests and burning them in the lake of fire, because later on, Jesus makes that connection with the place where they would burn the rubbish. So really, if you were to make a modern day comparison, it wouldn't be uh, to, the, to the people uh, requiring the people to tithe. The, the modern day comparison would be these wicked uh, prosperity preachers and teachers and, and mega church pastors who are hoarding all this money. And really the comparison would be that on judgment day, they will be taken outside of the city of Jerusalem and burned in the lake of fire forever. That's how I would really interpret that passage. But whatever the case, tithing uh, was something that was required under the law of Moses. And I've gone into that in great detail in my video on tithing. You can also check that out if you visit my uh, channel homepage. Um, so that's two verses that I think quite clearly uh, are not referring to giving money to the church, but are twisted and churches are twisting those verses to make millions. Now let's look at this next video that I've got for you. Check out this next one. Awesome. And I have a tithe and offering message this morning. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 8 verse 22. 
and it says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Let's say that together, shall not cease. It says, as long as the earth exists, it says seed time and harvest, it's always going to be in practice. It's always going to be in momentum. It's always going to produce for us. And so we can understand from this that us being able to plant our seed and to reap a harvest is something that is going to be in motion for our entire life. And Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, And let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And so it says that there's a harvest that's coming to us, and we're going to reap that harvest if we don't surrender, if we don't give up, if we don't throw in the towel, we're going to reap that harvest. And so I want to give you a few facts about your seed this morning, is that your seed is a bridge into your future. Your seed is a bridge into your future. Your seed has the power to predict your future. Your seed has the power to change your future. Your seed has the power to go in and rearrange what would have been financially into your future into something greater and bigger because your seed holds that power to create a bridge into your future. And also with your seed, if you have the right attitude with your seed, you know by the scripture that you will always reap. Now I know that some of you are going to comment about how painful that was to listen to and it was very painful to listen to that but it's something that you hear in churches all the time this idea of sowing your seed and and we have this idea from Genesis that's always quoted and this passage in Galatians and others which we'll look at uh, in a minute but um, let's just look at this first one that she quoted and and really, it just boggles the mind that people don't just pick up their Bibles and read the context. The context of the passage is that Noah has just come out of the ark. He's just come out of the ark and he's made a sacrifice to God. Let's read um, from Genesis chapter 8, just beginning at verse 20 to, to kind of get a bit of the context. It says this, Then Noah built an altar to Yahweh and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And Yahweh smelled the soothing aroma, and Yahweh said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again strike down every living thing as I have done. While all the days of the earth remain, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Quite clearly here, this passage has nothing to do with giving money to the local church. This passage is about uh, God saying and promising that he will always allow the seasons to be upon the earth, that he won't flood the earth again. And as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest and, and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night will always remain. This seems pretty, pretty clear when you look at the context. But let's look at this passage in Galatians that she quoted. Now, it's Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. But I, I want to begin in chapter 5, verse 17. It's important to remember that in the original text, th there is no chapters and verses. It's just a, a continuing flowing uh, of text. And really, you look at the thought, when the thoughts change. And I think the thoughts, you know, continue, uh, began really in chapter 5. If we look in chapter um, 5, verse 17, you can see, for example, it says, you know, the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you do not do the things that you want. And then it talks about the deeds of the flesh. It says in verse 19, the deeds of the flesh are evident. And it talks about sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, etc. It's talking about the, the works of the flesh, right? The deeds of the flesh. And then in verse 22, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And it talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and so on. And then he's encouraging them in verse 25, you know, to, to live in the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. And then verse uh, chapter 6, verse 1, it talks about if you see a brother caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness and humility and so forth. And then you get down to verse 7 of chapter 6, and it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. 
But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And then in context it says, And let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So in the context of the passage, the Apostle Paul you know, he starts off talking about the deeds of the flesh and um, then he talks about the fruit of the spirit. And, and then he says, you know, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. If, if you sow to the flesh, right? So if you, if you continue in your sin, if you continue practicing iniquity, um, then you will reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, that is, you, you begin to do the, the, the works of the Spirit, you begin to, to practice the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so forth, then it says you will reap eternal life. And really, when it says, and let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we are not weary, it's not talking about reaping money. It's talking about reaping the fruits of the Spirit in your life. When you have sin in your life, it's difficult to, to break free from it at times, you know. And if you continue to sow to the flesh, you will continue to reap corruption, right? The way that you overcome sin really is what Paul is saying is that you begin to do good. You begin to practice the fruits of the Spirit and you stop trying to feed the flesh. And as you continuously, you know, put to death the deeds of the flesh and seek to live righteously, and as you uh, continue to exercise the fruits of the Spirit and, and continue to do good, especially to other people, uh, and, well, obviously to other people, but especially to the household of faith, then in due time, as you continue practicing this, you will reap a harvest of righteousness in your life. It's called sanctification. That's really what the Apostle Paul is going on about. He's really not talking about giving money to the local church so that you can get money back. That's not what this passage is about. This passage is about uh, sowing to, uh, um, uh, doing good so that you will reap a harvest of righteousness in your life. Now let's check out this next clip. This next clip is by Todd White, and it's the Cheerful Giver passage, another very misunderstood passage. Check this one out. All right. In verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I just want to quickly pause it before I play you the clip because I want to make a couple of quick points about this video so that you can have them in your mind as you're watching. First of all, this is a small part of a live service, and Todd White is not the preacher for the service, but he is giving the offering message. And you can see on the, um, on the screen underneath, you'll have it, you know, how to give or something like that. The other thing is this, and this is what I wanted to point out to you and, and watch him as he preaches. When he reads this passage, he begins in verse seven. He reads, he reads verse seven and eight, and then he pauses, looks at verse nine and then reads verse 10 and skips verse 9. This is something actually that a lot of preachers do. And, and it really shows how deliberate their deceit is. Because verse 9 makes it very clear that this is about giving to the poor, not about giving to their churches, especially because they're filthy rich. But when you read verse 9, the passage that they skip, and it's interesting, he pauses, he looks at it, and then moves on to verse 10. But here's the clip from Todd White. I'll play it to you and then afterwards we'll, we'll talk about what this passage is really all about. All right. In verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, Now this I say, and he was talking about a bountiful gift. Oh gosh, let me just, let me just talk from here. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. Compulsion means, oh my gosh, I got to give and I'm guilted into giving. You can't be guilted into giving. God loves a cheerful giver. One that is cheerful about giving. There are people that actually have the gift of giving. That's an amazing, my wife has the gift of giving. Like, I've never seen anything like it. Like when a birthday party comes around, she's like, I just saw a, a, a picture of Andressa's 
baby. They just had a birthday party. Like I saw like a little video. I've never seen a birthday party set up for a one-year-old like I just saw. I like it looked like a $20,000 birthday party. It wasn't, but it was amazing. I'm like, oh my gosh, I would have loved to be that little kid. Like, what are you going to do for number two? Gosh. Like my wife, she threw like a, a crazy 50th. I came, I had no idea. I came into the sanctuary and it was full of people. And I turned 50 and I'm like, oh my God. And I immediately thought, how am I going to do this for her? I'm in big trouble. I need her gift of giving to tell me what to do for her. Oh, it's crazy. Okay. But you must give as purpose in your heart, not grudgingly under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that you always have all sufficiency in everything. You may have an abundance for every good deed. He supplies seed to the sower, bread for food, and will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase your harvest of your righteousness. Did you catch that? Did you notice he read verse 7, read verse 8, paused, looked at verse 9, but skipped it and read verse 10. Why did he do that? Well, because verse 9 makes it very clear what it's all about. It's about giving to the poor. Let me read it to you. It says this in verse 9, As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the needy. Some translations say he gave to the poor. His righteousness stands forever. So the context is very clear here. This is talking about giving to the poor. This is not talking about giving money to your local church to pay for the guitar, the drum kit and the keyboard and to uh, pay for the big TV screen to make the preacher look great. To, it's not talking about any of that. It's not talking about paying the up, uh, the running costs of a great expensive building. Uh, it's not talking about any of that. This is talking about giving to the poor. Every single passage that they try to use to guilt trip people into giving them money is usually about giving to the poor. That's what's always about giving to the poor. It's either Old Testament or it's about giving to the poor. That's always what these verses are about. And that's really the whole context of this passage. If you watched my previous video, we looked at um, chapter 8, the chapter just before, verses 1 to 4, and we saw that um, uh, um, the Apostle Paul was talking about a, uh, a gift from the Christian churches in Macedonia to the poor saints in Jerusalem. And we saw that you know, the purpose of this was not so that some people would be uh, well off and others would be suffering, but that there would be equality. And then he quoted uh, really from the book of Exodus where it says, He who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little had no lack. And we talked about how that uh, in the book of Exodus, those that gathered more than what they needed, uh, the leftover turned rotten. It became rotten and maggots uh, grew in there. So uh, that's quite an interesting point there. And really chapter 9 is flowing on from what he's saying. It's, he's talking about now the these Corinthian believers encouraging them to send aid to the Jerusalem saints, the poor saints suffering in Jerusalem. That's the whole context of of what's going on here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 to 10. But what's interesting here is that, notice it says in verse 9, His righteousness stands forever. This is very important because that's what this is really all about here. This is the encouragement to give, is to really, so that you can reap the fruit or the harvest of righteousness. It says in verse 10, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You see that? When, when you give, when you give to the poor, when you give to people who are in need, you are really producing the fruit of the Spirit. You are producing the fruit of righteousness. And God in turn will continue to supply to you what you need in order that you may continue giving to the poor, not so that you can be rich and wealthy and living comfortably and all this sort of stuff. No, it's so you can continue giving to people in need and increase the harvest of your righteousness, that you may produce more fruit 
of the Spirit. That's what's going on here in this passage. It's not talking about getting money, sowing seeds, sowing this money uh, into these uh, churches so that you can become rich. No, it's talking about giving to the poor and you are then producing the fruit of righteousness. That's what this is all about. Now, what's crazy is that some people are just blatantly deceitful, blatantly deceitful, and they'll just quote verses that are about giving to the poor and say, this is an example of giving your tithes and offerings to us. Check this out uh, from Joel Osteen, these clips from Joel Osteen. Thanks for being at Lakewood today. It's going to be a great summer for you and your family, and we're blessed to have you in person and online. Well, we'll take a moment to receive our tithes and our offerings. We always want to thank you for your donations, keeping the ministry going. You're not really giving to people, you're giving to the Lord. I love that scripture, it says, when you help those in need, you are lending to the Lord and He will repay you. I love that scripture, it says, when you help those in need, you are lending to the Lord and He will repay you. That's what you do each week or every time you give, you are lending to God and I know you've seen in your own life, God knows how to repay you. Nobody can pay you like God can pay you with, with good health, with ideas, good relationships, and with the finances you need to fulfill your destiny. Thanks again for being with us. Let's take a moment to receive our tithes and our offerings. Thank you for your generosity, for your giving each week, keeping the ministry going. I love the scripture that says, when you help those in need, you are lending to the Lord and He will repay you. Now it is true that Lakewood Church does give some money to the poor, but it's only a very small fraction of what they're given. And it's easy to be generous with other people's money. I mean, most of the money is wasted or it goes to Joel Osteen for his luxurious lifestyle. The, the church, Lakewood Church, the renovations alone cost $100 million. That's crazy stuff. Uh, Joel Osteen lives in a massive house, huge house. He's got a private jet. The guy's filthy rich. Uh, he goes on holidays all over the world. I mean, the money's being wasted. The money really should be given to the poor and to the needy and should be given to missionaries who are going out and spreading the gospel, going out and planting real churches where the word of God is preached. That's where this money ought to be going. We should never give this money to these churches. We should repent. The church community needs to repent of giving money to these filthy rich mega church pastors and their ministries. And they need to start giving to the poor and to the needy. And they need to start giving to missionaries. And I'm in contact with some missionaries that, um, that I'm going to talk to in order to encourage people to give to them. I'm just wanting to check things out more thoroughly with them. But, you know, we ought to be giving to missionaries. Every person should be looking. How can I give to missionaries? How can I find genuine missionaries around the world? There's lots of them out there and they don't get very much support at all, if any. And those are the people that we need to be giving to. Everybody should be looking for missionaries who are genuinely preaching the gospel and helping the poor and needy. I hope you've liked this video. If you have, please consider subscribing. Give me a thumbs up, hit the bell notification button. I'll see you in the comments section and you'll see me in my next video.